To be alive is to ask questions. Most are simple and involve nothing more than getting through the day. Some are bigger and shape our identities. But at the heart of every human being are three questions, and these define our humanity. Why do I suffer? How should I live? And what is it all for? These questions are common to all peoples and all cultures throughout all time. They follow us through life and cannot be suppressed, ignored, or laughed away. Sooner or later, these questions confront each one of us. Our own inner being demands an answer to them. Join us this semester as we hear what the Bible has to say about life's greatest questions and how they point us to a God who brings purpose to our pain, wisdom to our ways, and meaning to the measure of our days. Hello, hello, hello. Christian is on campus. How are we doing? How are we doing? I know this is a little different. It's live. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I contain my excitement for going live because I feel like we're like one step closer to Sanchez 104. Uh, give me some hands, thumbs up. You can hear me. Okay. You can hear me. Okay. 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 Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of like all the emojis on except the no. Don't give me a no. Don't cancel me tonight because I want to dispense God's word and minister God's word tonight. Um, and so my name is Ty Wilson. Um, I serve, I uh, have the privilege of serving on the wonderful staff. Christian is on campus. I was a student, a freshman, just like you. And even, I'll be honest with you, I met the club my freshman orientation. So that July, ever since then, has not been the same. Um, I would say I have eternal, eternal gratefulness for the experiences, the relationships I formed in this club. And if you are new here, if you're not new, I just want to tell you, it's so good to see you. Your faces, I can see a lot of faces, so it's really good. We could do this kind of setup. And going forward, the rest of the spring, we want to give it to you live every Thursday. And like Nathaniel's already put, Solid Ground is our once a week club meeting where we just gather to hear God's word, to worship to him, and just be built up with one another. And the thing is, you know, you probably have dinner around this time on Thursdays, but we want to serve you another dinner, and that's God, all right? God on a silver platter is for you for every Thursday, 7 to 8, 15. So if you, if you ask your friends, hey, uh, if they ask you what you're doing on Thursdays the rest of the semester, uh, you know, you, maybe you want to finish the rest of your uh, high school spring semester, maybe 7 to 8, 15, you got something to do. You got solid ground to make the Christians on campus even before you start in the fall. And so, like I said, it's good to see you all. And like I said, also, we've been diving into life's greatest questions. That is our topic, our series uh, for this semester. And if you're just, you know, first time in, that's okay. Or you've even been in a while, that's okay for solid ground. Let me remind you, um, life's greatest questions, really what, what that entails is, you know, innate in every single human being are these questions, right? Why was I created? You know, like who has not asked that? Even from if you're in Sunday school or Bible studies in youth group or even in college, in your biology class, that's fine. But in, innate in us is this, is this question, why was I created? How about that? And then secondly, wh why do I go through suffering? What is the purpose of my suffering? Why did God allow me to go through that, still go through this, still struggle with that? What is the purpose behind my pain? And then of course, how do we live? How do we do this thing called life? How, do, how, how am I a proper human? How can I be a proper Christian, have a proper church life that's depicted from the word? How do I live? Um, and then Ecclesiastes, this question comes up, what is the meaning behind it all? What is the purpose, the, the driving force? Why I should get out of bed in life? And so going through Job, um, Proverbs, um, and then Ecclesiastes, that's what we want to answer. Life's greatest questions. And the way we're answering it, the way we're responding it, is not just you know Googling this every week and give you some random advice here. We're going to the word of God. I love this verse in Psalms. It says that the unfolding of God's word gives light. The unfolding of God's word gives light. And so that's what we want to come to with these questions is let's, see, let's unfold the Bible, unpack the Bible, unveil to see what God has to say about why we were created, why we suffer, how we should live and what is it all for? We want to really come to the word. And like um, the thing you also put, we've been in Job for a while, and now we're shifting to Proverbs. Um, Proverbs, as you may know, um, and we're in Gintu tonight, this is a part two, a part two to that. 
um, first part was the multifarious wisdom of God. And it's so loaded, we needed two parts, okay? That's how loaded this topic is. And honestly, we, we could spend the whole solid ground series on just the multifarious wisdom of God. This, this topic of you seeing the outline, it's in the chat, it's in the app. If you heard it, we have an app. If you're new, get the app. We're gonna tell you that 20 times, get the app, um, it's there. But at the top of the outline is the multifarious wisdom of God. Take it from that verse in Ephesians 3.10. The only verse that uses this word multifarious, but we'll unpack that in a little bit. But I just want to give y'all like a, you know, a, um, a fresh lens, a fresh eyes for this book of Proverbs. Because I think if you ask any Christian, this is one of the books that I will say we have in our back pocket as far as even quotes, um, just some study. And I even I looked at Bible Gateway, a Bible website, you know, Bible reading website. And out of the top 10 books that is most studied by Christians, guess what number of Proverbs is? What, what number? I'll put it in the chat. What, what, what do you think? What number it is? Number one, two, 10, nine. Okay, I see two. Okay, three. It's number five. It's number five. Okay. First is uh, Psalms, Matthew, John, Romans. And then there you have Proverbs. Proven to you that this book is pretty familiar to us. And this concept of wisdom, uh, we probably have some idea about it, but not like tonight. Uh, we want to really impress you with God's wisdom, wisdom from our only wise God. And, and so I, I would even say, you know, we have some um, incoming freshmen in, in this meeting tonight. We invited them out tonight. Um, when you might not know this street, but you're going to know it's soon called Dean Keaton. OK, Dean Keaton. And if you if you're joining my prayerful spirit in, in August of 2021, I, I want to meet you. Some of y'all on Dean Keaton in person. And we want to go in a building and eat. That, that's like my prayerful dream. The thing we get kind of back to normal after this pandemic. But Dean Keaton, for all the new people, is a street in UT. Um, and I was passing along there as a student and someone passed me a Bible. And in the Bible was a green Gideon Bible. It's really small, pocket size. And what was in it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Psalms, and Proverbs. Right. It's kind of like that's the go-to Christian book for instruction, for wisdom, right? And that's what Proverbs actually is. It's a collection of words of the wise, right? A collection of wisdom and prudence. And that's how we can see how we can live as Christians, as human beings. Um, but tonight, we really want to have this overarching view of what wisdom is, especially God's view of his multifarious wisdom. And I want to I wanna see, uh, you know, I have a prayer every solid ground. Uh, either I pray with someone, I pray to myself as I'm in a watch party or, you know, behind the camera. It is, Lord, give me something. Give all the students something tonight. Um, and in these crazy times, what we need most is the word of God to sustain us. And last week, uh, part one, Connor, my brother, he gave, he gave me something. I feel like I got something. And I hope y'all got it too. I'm going to remind y'all, it impressed me. So he brought up in the last part of his speaking on Matthew 25, right? The 10 versions. Um, uh, five were wise, prudent, five were foolish, right? I and mean, y'all caught that. So this, this completely revolutionized my concept of a wise believer, oh, being wise, walking in wisdom, because instantly I'm thinking I need to memorize more Bible, right? I need to like, you know, take a verse from all 1,189 uh, chapters in the Bible and just like, I just need to like muse on it and know it from the back of my pocket to pull it out in any instance. Actually, taken from Connor's fellowship last week, to be wise, to be in that, in that group of wise virgins, wise believers, walking in prudence, is to get filled with the Spirit, is to have their vessel filled with God. So that was, that's what separated and distinguished these five prudent virgins and the five foolish virgins, is that the five prudent virgins, the five wise ones, were the ones that took the opportunity to touch God before he came, before the bride room came. And that's what we want to do tonight. We want to be wise in a sense. We want to gain more God, have God further uh, uh, seen in us, advanced in us, growing in us so that we can be ready to meet our bridegroom. How about that? And so take it from that. Um, th that's what characterized those virgins. They were wise because they took time to get filled. And that is what is the kind of landing mark or caveat to this next part in multifarious wisdom of God is the part two. Um, you see in your outline, God's work in us. You can stay muted, or, and if you're in your watch party, say it to your watch party muted, that's fine. 
Say, God's work in us. How about that? I see some mouths moving. That's good. God's work in us. Now, I want to, you can even, you can even put, a, if you have a, print out your outline, you can put this, God's work in me. God's work in me is a manifestation of his multifarious wisdom. How do we see that? The first verse here, 1 Corinthians 1 30. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom to us from God, both righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All right, it's kind of a loaded verse, but Connor hit this too last week. It was that Christ becoming wisdom to us, right? Becoming wisdom to us from God entails some kind of transaction, becoming something, something changed from one thing to another. What happens? Christ objectively, Christ in his person, Christ, the wisest man that ever lived on this earth, is imparted into us, becomes something to us. What does he become? Our righteousness sanctification and redemption. And you're like, okay, how do you see God working in us in that? Like, okay, so I don't get it. That's why we have more Bible for you. Under that is verse 1 Thessalonians 4, 23. You know what this says? And the God of peace will sanctify you holy and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you catch this verse, your spirit soul and body so you can connect some dots here here is where christ becomes our righteousness all right our soul is where christ wants to sanctify and spread in us you know when we pray those prayers lord grow in me lord mature in me conform me more to your son's image you know what happens you get a little bit more sanctified you get a little more spreading in your soul your inward parts your heart that's what god is doing and what is it going to end up in? The result of that is actually your body, um, the redemption of your body, glorification. You know, you read that in the Bible. That's going to happen to us as believers in this process, in this step by step, more sanctification, sanctification, more growth in God. This is what happens. Righteousness, sanctification, glorification. That's God's work in us. And this is marvelous. OK, I don't know if y'all uh, just just kind of just muse upon your own salvation. God's your God's work in you personally. Um, and I would say if you have never had this personal experience of God coming into you and then growing in you, I'm glad you're joining solid ground tonight. I'm glad you're interested in some Christian fellowship because we're all about that. in Seesaw, we're all about the advancement of God, the growth of God, the the Christ making home more in our heart. And I'm gonna bring this up too, you know, for all these new people here. Um, this is a wristband, okay? Oh, you can't really see it. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Okay. People call it some divine hieroglyphics. Okay, you're like, wait, wait, wait what's this? This is a Seesaw wristband. This is not just a fashion statement that we make as a club, you know, because we're cool, but it has some uh, very uh, important steps God had to take to get into us to get into our spirit, to spread to our soul, to, to ultimately glorify our bodies. That's God's work in us. And this is the steps he had to take. So if you're new here, sign up for a welcome kit on, the, on our app. You get this, you know, that's God becoming a man, Jesus Christ, to die for us, for our sins. He was buried. That's like a tomb right there. On the third day, he rose, resurrected, became the life-giving spirit. Now he's at the right hand of God. And now as a spirit, he can come into us whenever we say, oh, Lord Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, come into me. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the dead, and I want you to save me. When you pray that prayer, God's work happens. Happens. He comes into our spirit. He can start to spread into our soul and eventually glorify our body. That's God's work in us. That is Christ becoming wisdom to us, that is God's, God's way of saving us. And let me ask you this, um, as awesome as that is, okay, would you call that a masterpiece? Like, let's just say I can see uh, Josh Dexter. I, would you say that your Christian life, God coming into you and saving you, that's, that, that you're a masterpiece of God? I mean, I mean, you could say that. Um, I even know this brother, I was uh, roommates with him at one point, and he had told me his testimony of how he got saved. He, um, 
You know, he came from a Christian family. He went to college and just wanted to peace out of the Christian life, hang up the cape. And he joined a fraternity actually, and actually started actually on substance abuse. And what happened was that he turned more away from God, his family, his friends, and miraculously, I would say miraculously, as he put it, his testimony, as he's sharing with me one night um, as we were roommates, and he shared with me that God appeared to him in a very real way through the word. And he had a 180 turn back to God. And now you know what he's doing now? He's in campus ministry in Georgia. How about that? <laughs> That's miraculous, right? That is just this, that brother's testimony, how God can turn a sinner into a member of the body of Christ to even serve him, right? But what would you say creation is like a masterpiece? Like wouldn't God characterize his own masterpiece, not just saving a sinner to make him a member of the body of Christ, right? But what about God, his wisdom being demonstrated, his, his person being exhibited um, by just creation, right? Just look on, you know, National Geographic and just look at the beauties of the wonders of the world, right? You could say that. But actually, I'll take you, I'll take the word for itself. You know what the word says? You know what Paul says? is the masterpiece of God. Ephesians 2.10, it's easy to remember. We got Ephesians 3.10 today and Ephesians 2.10, all right? Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his masterpiece. Who's the we? It's the body of Christ, the church, right? That's the advancement in this, in this, in this topic tonight, the multifarious wisdom of God. Yes, Christ wants to become wisdom to us, by working in us to spread from our spirit, soul, and body. But what is his masterpiece? How his multifarious wisdom is demonstrated is not in one member he's working in, but a group, the church, the body of Christ. That, how, that is how Ephesians 2.10 is characterized as the masterpiece of God. In Greek, this means the poema, mean like a poem, a masterful work by a handyman, a, a craftsman, that has beautifully designed something that is more remarkable. That is the body of Christ. That is everybody on the Zoom call. I see, I see 88 participants and it is more than that because it's some watch parties. God's work in all of us is his, called his masterpiece. That's what we want to look at tonight. How God's multifarious, the only time that word is used in the Bible is relation to the church, right? You read that verse again at the top of your sheet. You can say on mute, but you can read it with me in order that now the, to the rulers and to the authorities in the heavenlies, the multifarious wisdom of God might be made known through the church, through the church, through the church. He wants to make his wisdom known to us, but through the church means manifested through us. Even the word multifarious, this probably, you probably like, wow, I didn't even know that was the Bible. Yeah, it's there. Multifarious means manifold, right? Diverse, a myriad, multifaceted, um, differing colors, right? Diverse manifestations. Um, that is what the body of Christ is. God to work in all of us to showcase all of his, all that he is, all that he worked in us. Um, it's the church, you can write this down. If you're taking notes, even if your app, you can, is a notes tab, you can still take some notes. You can send it to somebody, send it to yourself. The church is the wise exposition of God. The church is the wise ex exposition of God. Like, like a showcase of all that he is, right? God is wise in himself for creating the universe and creating me and even saving my, my brother I told you about his dynamic salvation. But what he says is his multifarious wisdom being manifested is his work in the church. That's us. And that's what leads us to our next point here in the outline. And again, getting to this point, even if you are just, I don't know, like a meek, quiet Christian, you know, you don't raise your voice too much to the Lord. Um, when we get into this section, I hope there's a leaping and a skipping in your spirit. I, I just hope, even if it's like a little, like a little jump, because getting into this section, God's boast to Satan, you really unlock God's purpose for the church. You really unlock 
the multifarious wisdom of God. How, do, how is God going to manifest his wisdom on a large scale? It's through this section. God's boast to Satan. Okay, I'm going to read this verse. You can read it silently with me on mute. This is Romans 16, 20. It says, now the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. I don't know if y'all caught it. I don't know if you, if this is not underlined in your Bible, okay, it's about to be now. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. All right. This is not, he didn't say under the feet of the apostle Paul, under Martin Luther, or any of prominent one believer. He says your feet. In Greek, this is a plural form. You all, not y'all in a sense, but you all, right? Means a corporate sense. And even in this section of Romans 16, it's talking about the church. It's talking about the body of Christ. It's like 20 different believers stated by Paul in this letter, in this chapter. And so what he's emphasizing here is that God is ready to crush the enemy to the feet of the church, the built up believers, right? God's work in us individually produces this work corporately to shame the enemy. That's what a boast is. A boast is a shame to the adversary of God. A boast is a, I told a brother this once, it's almost a flex to the enemy. Look what I've done to defeat you, to crush you. The crushing under your feet is the feet of believers on this call who were once Without God, no hope in the world, scattered, God was, is able and is able and is doing and will do, build us up together to shame the enemy. Hallelujah. So even go back to that verse in Ephesians 3.10, right? The most I fear is wisdom of God is being made known through the church. Who is that being made known to though? Who's the audience to this spectacle? But the audience to this exhibition, it's the enemy. It's every opposer, every rebellion, uh, angel, rebellious angel and demon that followed him against God. God wants to showcase to him. I worked in these people and I built them up. Hallelujah for this boast. Um, I want to even give you more in this that um, this is this verse here from, I think it's from, go back to it, from Deuteronomy. 3230, how shall one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? Um, so if, you, if you're really looking at this verse closely, I hope you are, you kind of realize there's some, there's some interesting mathematics here, but that's some divine mathematics, right? When one person, when one pursuer of the Lord can only chase, in a sense, the enemy, a, a thousand of them, a thousand enemies, right? But what about two? What about two companions? What about two in your community group? How, about, how many can you chase? Chase the enemy away? 10,000. This doesn't really line up. It should be 2,000. But that is the emphasis, the intensified strength of a believer with another believer. Right? And so that's what we want to see here. This boast God is making to Satan. And this leads us to you. Our response. So I have two points here before we wrap up, is to really see this, to see this boast, to see how we can have God continually work in us, to have this, this testimony against the enemy, so God can really be manifested in a full way. We need, we need this response. One, our attitude to our hardships, and two, our, our, our hearts be built up with other believers. Um, you know, I have this verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our momentary lightness of affliction works out for us more and more surpassingly in eternal weight of glory. This also is a verse you can put in your back pocket when you need some comfort and some trials that you go through. This was Paul's attitude and view for why he suffered, right? This is his attitude and perspective and lens to why, when I'm going through something, it, it, is, it is working out for me, eternal weight of glory. And I have this quote here from the study I did getting into this topic is, God is so wise to even use our failures, shortcomings, mistakes in order to work more into us. So 
you know, we're about to, we almost reached this, what? This week is one year in the pandemic. One year since the world shut down. I can remember when we did Solid Ground in Sanchez 104 of, about a year ago, right? Um, think about how many hardships you've had, physically, psychologically, spiritually, all those things. Can we have the Apostle Paul's view to 2 Corinthians 4? Lord, this worked out for me, a weight, gold. I, I came away out of this pandemic through every trial you brought me through with more of you working in me. To even come to the point like Apostle Paul, thanking the Lord, thanking the only wise God for giving opportunities, setting up opportunities so he can broadcast his wisdom, right? And I have this note on this hymn. Um, I put it as my personal go-to. Um, it's hymn 341 in some hymnals. The one I have, it is well with my soul. Um, classic. Um, and obviously it's even hard to go to a, a say you mean a memorial or a funeral without even hearing this song sang. And I, I kind of dove into this story song of this writer, Horatio Spafford. He, he mentions in his, how he wrote this hymn is through some suffering he had. And I want to highlight that this brother, Horatio Spafford, he wrote this hymn out of this experience of suffering, right? And this might be many of us, how the only wise God can use situations to bring forth more of his expression and even to encourage others like this hymn that we treasure throughout Christian history. So this brother Horatio, he was in Chicago and his family was going to England, right? So he, he was gonna go later since he was working in Chicago. He's gonna meet up with them later. So they take a ship over to England, his wife and four kids. You know what happens? The ship collided with another ship and it sank. And his four children passed away in that certain spot going from America to England. And his wife survived actually, it was a blessing. And when he got word about what happened with his family, um, Horatio took, you know, uh, the next ship out that when it was safe over to England to be with his wife to, to grieve. And as he was passing over the spot where the wreck happened, where his where he lost the children, um, the captain came out to him and told him, "This is this this is this is the exact spot. This is it." And you know what he does? Takes time with God and he writes this hymn, hymn three forty one. It is well with my soul. And it has this line in it, and the, the blessed assurance be my control. Assurance of what? That God can use suffering, shortcomings, hardships for something eternal, for something for his body, for something for his purpose. That was a brother Horatio's view why he suffered, is that God has an eternal view for this temporary affliction. So more than that too, is the two, how can we further see and experience the multifarious wisdom of God, even in CSOC, even as we're in high school and college, is having a heart to be built up with others. Like I brought up the biggest boast of the enemy is not simply God's work in Ty Wilson, how he's gonna transform me and conform me to his image more and more. Actually, what God is after and his desire is a built up group of people, a group of believers. How about a CG, right? And so what is our heart to be built up with others, right? Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be troubled, right? I want some wise men to walk with. I hope you have this heart and this burden as for your Christian life. I need some wise men, some wise brothers and sisters to walk this Christian life with. Even go back to the Matthew 25, what Connor mentioned. You know, there are five prudent virgins, not just one, meaning there was a group, maybe a community group of ones that wanted to get filled with God daily. Every opportunity as they could in college and in high school is to pursue Christ. And I wanna leave you with some, some questions, not to, not to call anybody out or to, uh, you know, uh, put any blame on any CG, but these questions uh, I want to kind of leave you with going into our view of community groups and our view of being built up is how about this? 
with two months left in this pandemic school year, am I still suffering in silence? In this two months left of this pandemic school year, am I still suffering in silence, right? Have I not opened to anybody in my community group? Do I have kind of a very low conscience of being built up with the brothers and sisters in my group? How about that? And then have I left my companions unread? How about that? Have I left my companions unread? How about that practical uh, uh, application here, right? You know, this gets really real, especially this spring break coming up in a couple of days. Are you gonna leave your companions, your brothers and sisters, the ones you can be built up with, the ones you can crush the enemy with, the ones you can pursue to be filled with? Are we gonna leave them unread this spring break or the rest of this semester? I hope not. I hope our heart to be built up with others is strengthened after tonight. And I hope that we have another view of why we even suffer more tonight and how God can use all of our suffering, all of our hardships for something eternal in his view to even to showcase to the enemy, Satan, you did not have CSOP. You did not take them out during the pandemic. But when we come back in August, God can boast to Satan. Everyone in CSOC grew a little bit more, got a little bit more field in their vessel, had a little bit more transformation. That's what we want for the club. That's what we want for all of us. So the enemy can be shamed and God can get his glory. So I'm going to pray for us before we go to our CG breakout rooms. And we're going to be encouraged to go about the rest of our spring break and spring semester. Dear Heavenly Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for this series. Thank you. We can just be under your hearing, your uh, hearing of faith, your words, Lord. Thank you for unfolding week to week more and more of your purpose to us. Bless everyone here with more, more building, Lord, to more eternal weight of glory for every situation we go through. Lord, thank you for your wisdom to be showcased to the enemy. And Lord, thank you for your work in us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Give it back to you, Brother Nathaniel. Hey, we hope you've been enjoying our solid ground. And if you want more life, truth, and spirit-filled content, simply subscribe to our Seesaw YouTube page right there, right there, or download the link below our Seesaw app that will give you content daily and weekly in God's Word. So we hope you can stay connected with us at Christian Students on Campus.